wear my football uniform today, but I'm a um, New York Giants fan. I thought I would just avoid the shaming. Um, but I very much do enjoy football. I'm excited for the Super Bowl. Um, so I have a confession. I do something, well, I'm trying not to do it anymore, but I do something that I recently found out was very rude. So this is something that I've been doing because I see other people do it. It's become kind of normal. It just became a habit, and I've continued to do it. I haven't thought anything about it until recently I was with someone, and we were in the store, and there was someone else who was doing said thing. And the person I was with said, ugh, I hate when people do that. It is so rude. So I very awkwardly had to say, I do that. And since that interaction, I've really tried not to do it. But here it is, my confession. I do this. I talk on the phone while I'm checking out at the store, at the grocery store, the gas station, whatever it is. Does anyone else do this? Is anyone guilty of this? OK, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I feel like there might be a couple more people every now and then. Anyway, I've just gotten the habit of it. It feels like throughout the day, there's just not enough time to connect with people who call us. And so, you know, as you're checking out online, it feels like a perfect opportunity. I'm trying not to do it. But what can I say? We have to multitask, right? Just feels like there's not enough time. How many of you this week have said something like, it's just a crazy week? Or, I just, I don't have enough time. Or maybe once things calm down, I will blank. How many of you have said something like that? Yes, many of you, right? In the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes wrote an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And he, in the essay, he predicted that by 2030, so 10 years from now, we would have a 15-hour work week. A 15-hour work week. He thought with the growing advances in technology and the global economy, we would only need to work 15 hours a week. Amen. Amen. Yes. So there are speculations about how this economist majorly missed the mark. Was it because he thought we would only work for the amount of things that we need and didn't anticipate that we would actually want and need more stuff? Some people think it's because people actually enjoy their jobs more than leisure. How many people enjoy their jobs more than leisure? OK, no one, maybe one person. OK, yep. So it looks like by 2030, I don't think that we will enjoy a 15-hour work week. So my question for you is, what would you do if you only had 15 hours of work a week? Only 15 hours of school or absolutely necessary responsibilities, what would you do? Talk to the person next to you. Tell them, what would you do with all of that extra time? So what would you do? Shout out your answers. What would you do with all that extra time? Road trip. Road trip. Travel. Yes. What else? What? Volunteer. Volunteer. But they're only open 15 hours a week. Right. <laughs> so, yep. What else? Anything else? Baked bread. Baked bread. Yes. That's delicious. I, I like to think I would get really swole. Like, I would train for like an Ironman or do CrossFit or something. I like to think that. Probably not. But, um, yeah, maybe I would learn like how to play an instrument or something finally. Learn something about music. Anyway, we can dream. What would we do with all this time? We are all very busy. We are all very good at multitasking. We have to be. What if I told you the solution to our time problem is not actually more time? Seems like we don't have enough time, but the solution to that is actually not having more time. We've been going through this series called Mapping the Way, Markers of Discipleship. It's all about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What are the markers of discipleship? And last week, I talked about how in the beginning of Mark, this book that's all about Jesus, when Jesus begins his ministry, he basically says, the kingdom is here. Repent and believe the good news. Or in the message translation, it says, time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. God's world, 
the way in which God intended us to live. It is here, and we, as we follow Jesus, our lives change. Last week I talked about how our relationship to money changes, but also our relationship to time changes. What if I told you there was a different way of existing in the world? A way that is not fraught with anxiety and busyness and hurry. A way in which your time and your presence and your attention isn't divided between the person at the cash register and the person on your cell phone. A way of existing where you don't feel insatiably hungry for more time. Always feeling like, I just need more time. A way of living in the world in which you feel loved and rested and full of life. Wayne Mueller wrote a book on the Sabbath, which is a day of rest that we take every week. And in this book, he said, yes, we are strong and capable people. We can work without stopping, faster and faster, electric lights making artificial days so the whole machine can labor without seizing. But remember, no living thing lives like this. There are greater rhythms, seasons, and hormonal cycles, and sunsets, and moonrises, and great movements of seas and stars. We are part of the creation story subject to all its laws and rhythms. All life requires a rhythm of rest. What if there's a way of existing in the world that involves a rhythm of rest? Let me say a prayer for us and we'll dive into the passage for today. God, thank you that you invite us into a new way of being, one in which we don't have to hurry and feel busy and pulled in a million different directions, but can rest and feel restored and full of life. God, as we dive into your word, would you invite us into that way of being? In your name we pray, amen. So like I said, we're in the book of Mark, which is a story all about Jesus. We've been hopping around. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 23. If you want to follow along your Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you. At this point in Mark, there are these religious leaders who follow the law really well, who are already challenging Jesus' authority and his way of doing things. And here they challenge him on the Sabbath, which was this day of rest. In verse 23, it says, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God. During the days when Abathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves, of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. So in the story, we have these religious leaders who are following the law very religiously, very strictly, this law that God gave his people to help them love God and love each other well, to be a light to the rest of the world. And they were so strict about following the law that they had other rules that would help them follow this law. So a Sabbath, this one day a week in which they would rest, they had other laws that would help them follow the Sabbath. Because what does it really mean to rest? What is considered work, right? So for them, okay, you don't take a certain amount of steps. You can only walk so far on the Sabbath. You can't harvest, right? That would be considered work. And so here in this scenario, the followers of Jesus, the disciples, are harvesting grain on the Sabbath to eat. And so they call Jesus out and say, hey, look, your your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. They recognize that Jesus has authority over his disciples. And Jesus reference this story in the first half of your Bible. And he says this kind of sarcastically, like, are you not familiar with the scripture? Because clearly their issue is not that they are unfamiliar with the law or unfamiliar with the Bible. And he tells a story when David, who was anointed to be king, ate bread that according to the law he was not supposed to. 
And the point that Jesus is making is sometimes there are things that are more important than the law, like when people are hungry, right? Sometimes if we follow the law so strictly, we actually lose the meaning and the purpose, which is to love God and love other people. So the Sabbath that was supposed to be a gift, rest, rest is good, has become a burden. It's kind of like when you're growing up and you have a rhythm of rest, you have a nap. And when you're younger, you hate it. And you have to do it every day. And now that you're older, you look back and feel like, what was I thinking? I wish I could nap every day. Naps are great. I don't know about you. I have considered moving to Spain just for the siesta. Let's be real, right? Sabbath has become a burden. Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> Walter Brueggemann, who wrote a book on the Sabbath, said that the fourth commandment, which is practicing the Sabbath, is the most difficult and the most urgent in our society. And I would have to agree that it is both difficult and urgent. But why is it so important and why is it so difficult in our culture? Because first, we live in a culture that is busy and stressed and burnt out. Ben Hunnicutt, who is a leisure scholar, his job is literally to study leisure. That sounds very nice. And a book I was reading said that in the Middle Ages, the sin of sloth had two forms. So uh, there was one side of it, which was this paralysis and this inability to do anything, what we would consider laziness, that was part of it. The other side of sloth was this acedia. It was running around frantically, running around in a hurry, but not really getting anywhere. I don't think there are many people in our culture who have this issue of laziness, but they may deal with the other side of sloth, running around frantically everywhere, but not feeling really effective in what they are doing. I read in an article that Canadians in one year will collectively accumulate 10 million unused vacation days. 10 million unused vacation days. Megan said that's very sad. It is very sad. And I read reasons why people don't take their vacation days. And one of the things that I read is that there are people who don't want to go on vacation because they don't want to deal with their email inbox when they come back to work. It is too overwhelming. I also read that there are people who set an alarm to get up in the middle of the night to send an email so that their workaholic boss will think that they actually are up all night working. Our boundaries around work are not so great in our culture. The way that we respond to email and to work, it's getting so out of hand, so much that France, January 1st, enacted a law that was called the right to disconnect from email to help people deal with the stress and the burnout that they feel around work. Because economists say now that the way that we work is so stressful, it's the fifth leading cause of death that it actually makes us more susceptible to inflammation, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's. Good morning, welcome to reunion. I promise every sermon is not this de depressing. And there is good news to come. I hope that I've convinced you that we are busier than ever before. We definitely are not any closer to a 15 hour work week. We have all this technology, but it seems to only make us work more and harder and spread us even more thin. We are busy and we are overconnected. I have this photo that someone sent me a couple uh, years ago, back in 2018, of the yellow vest protest that happened in France. And this, the caption of this photo was selfie while Paris burns, question mark. Not only are we very busy in our culture, but we are also insanely overconnected. So overconnected that we are not actually present to the moment or what is happening in front of us. There could be chaos happening right in front of us, but we are taking a selfie. How often do you check your phone every day? How soon after you get up do you check your phone? Is it the first thing? that you do. 
I read that the average Canadian checks her phone 10 times per hour, so that would be once every 10 minutes. But I suspect that it's even more than that, right? Some people are nodding, I think so. Because of technology, we are not only overconnected, but we also have become expert multitaskers. We are so good at multitasking. Add that to your resume. We pay a bill while we drive to point B. We can catch up on the news while we are on hold, while we talk to our kids about how their day was and dinner is heating up on the stove. We are spread so thin, we are overconnected to the point that it becomes overwhelming to even decide who, what do I focus on? We are overwhelmed with people, with information. It's leading to what researchers call decision fatigue. We can't decide what to think about, what to focus on. It wears on our brain. We lose brain power to make decisions. There are famous people like Steve Jobs, Obama, Albert Einstein, who wear almost the same thing every day. I have a picture here of Steve. Yep, there, there's his outfit, the turtleneck, the jeans, because they don't want to waste any of the brain power to make decisions because our brain is already overwhelmed with all the decisions that we have to make. They want to save some of their decision-making power. When I was writing my thesis and I was feeling really burnt out, every Saturday when I would go sit down in Starbucks to write, I would wear the same outfit. It became known as my thesis writing uniform and all my friends would tease me about it because I just felt too tired to even decide what to wear. We are busy, we are stressed out, we are burnt out, we are overconnected, we are so good at multitasking, we are connected to a thousand moments, a thousand things at once. So my question is, how can we be present to ourselves, to the people actually in front of us, to God, when we are distracted, when we are connected to thousands of people at once? How can we be present to what God is doing in a specific moment if we are connected to a thousand moments at once? If we can't even decide what to focus our attention on, how can we participate in what God is doing? What then is the solution to our busy, burnt out, stressed out lives where we are multitasking and overconnected? In her book, Overwhelmed, How to Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time, the author, Bridget Schultz, says that the solution to our stressed out and busy lives is what she calls open space. Open space. Scheduling time in your calendar to do nothing. Just to stop. The word Sabbath, the Hebrew word Shabbat, literally means to stop. To seize. Could it be that our solution to our busy, overconnected, stressed out, burnt out lives is not more time, but actually stopping, doing less, Sabbath, resting? What actually is Sabbath? What does it mean to rest? I'm going to try and synthesize a very large biblical theme in a couple minutes. So I'm sorry if you are on information overload right now. There are two passages that I'm going to refer to about Sabbath in the Bible. The first is in Exodus 20, starting with verse 8. It says, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now in another passage in the Old Testament, there's a similar description of Sabbath, except at the end it says the reasoning is to remember that you were only slaves in Egypt. But the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. So what is the Sabbath? What is this day that we practice a day of rest? Three things I noticed in this passage. The first is that Sabbath is rest. 
It's a day to stop. It's a day not to work. You don't have to hustle and grind every day. You get to take a break. And it's not just a day off where you catch up on errands and do all the things that you didn't have time to do that week. It's a day to rest. And in this first passage in Exodus, we see that God rested. God created the world and rested. So my question is, if God is almighty, all-powerful, infinite creator of heaven and earth, if he rested, why is it that we think we don't need to? Almighty, all-powerful God rested. We are human, finite. When God created humans, he said it was very good. We eventually will die. Again, welcome to reunion. Loads of good news here. Um, Why do we think we don't need to rest? God rested. Sabbath is first about rest. It is also about resistance. It is about resisting the ways of Pharaoh. Before Israelite was formed to this nation, they were slaves in Egypt. And they worked and they lived in a culture that was very similar to ours. Emphasis on the grind, on production and consumption. And God liberated them from that. And when we rest, when we practice one day a week choosing not to work, we are resisting the temptation to believe that we are defined by our work. That if the temptation to believe that if I don't get this done, if I don't get an A on this test, if I don't get this degree, if I don't get this promotion, or if my house isn't in perfect order for when these people come over, then I'm no one. It's an opportunity to resist the temptation to believe that. And to resist the belief that no one will take care of you. To instead trust that there is a God who created the universe who provides for you. So Sabbath is rest and resistance, and last it is reorientation. It's an opportunity for us to reorient ourselves to God, to his world, to a different way of existing, and to his presence. To his way, which is justice and equality. If you notice in these passages about Sabbath, everybody practices Sabbath. Everyone, the foreigners, the livestock, female and male servants. Sabbath was an equalizer, a day that nobody had to work. Everyone was equal. It reminds me a little bit of, I don't know if you had this in grade school, someone would get to be principal for a day. It's like this child who has seemingly no power gets to be principal. Sabbath was this equalizer. Sabbath was rest and resistance and reorientation. So my question for you, as you discuss in your groups, is how do we actually practice Sabbath? Like, how do we practice a day of rest that feels like rest and resistance and reorientation? So talk amongst yourself in groups. How do we practice Sabbath in that way? What are your ideas? And then we'll come back together. How do we practice Sabbath? How do we do it in a way that's rest and resistance and reorientation? Yes, Megan. The Enneagram 3 is going to start a support group for people who hate resting. I love it. I thought a lot about threes as I was writing this sermon. Yep. How many of us are threes? A lot of threes. Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. So if you're a three, talk to Megan after. What other ideas, what other things came up in conversation? Chris has something to say. Perfect. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too. As I was kind of trying to synthesize, there really is so much I think that fits into Sabbath and this theme and the way that we practice it. And like one thing I thought about was, you know, when we practice Sabbath, do we decide maybe as a way of resisting, I'm not going to buy anything that day? Like I'm not going to require anyone else to work for me? Or I'm going to be more intentional about the things that I buy? Not maybe starting on that day, but then as that kind of flows into the rest of the week, fair trade, things like that. Um, I don't know. Those are some things that I thought about as a way of resisting. But even resisting, you know, the busyness and the overconnecting, do we decide to turn off our cell phone or not check our email? Or I think those are things that I thought of. But there's a lot more, I think, that comes along with resisting in that. Yeah. Other thoughts? Alex? I think there's just uh, like a lot of the time when we talk about rest, we automatically think uh, that it's in isolation. Yeah. Um, there's this kind of sense of like rest equals sleep, mm-hmm. you know, or being by ourselves, and yet yeah. we're called into, uh, we're called to cr- as a community rest. Mm-hmm. Like you said, like not demand of other people that they serve our Sabbath. Yep. Um, and yet, at the same time, when everyone's resting, what does that what does that look like? That doesn't yeah. mean a lack of of interaction or a lack of community. Yeah. Um, we're called to do it, to do that together, and so how can we how can we be intentional about collectively resting? Yeah. Yep. And even feasting together, having a meal, or doing like I like sometimes like to think as Sabbath as pray and play. Like it's time to orient ourselves towards God. It's also things that we do that are life-giving. It's not necessarily sitting in isolation, but being with people. And that's, I think, when the Enneagram can also be helpful because it's based off your kind of your personality. Like for me, an introvert, yes, sometimes rest is isolation. But anyway. <laughs> yes, Liz. I'm totally with the curse on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can reorient myself. I can mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. The recipes I can struggle with sometimes is how does that balance between the introvert being the man on the Enneagram. Uh, the resistance piece is the struggle. Yeah. Because it's like it, it involves other people. And maybe mm-hmm. that is a part of my personality that mm-hmm. I I'm trying to people please so I can't put the boundaries up. Mm-hmm. I can't turn the phone off because I gotta make sure that yep. I'm on call or I'm yep. responsible or I'm yeah. So I think that, that that's a piece that's a real, it's an individual thing, yes, but definitely in our culture, it's, it's all over the place. Yep. Totally. Thanks for sharing that, Liz. Yeah, Charles? One thing that I, I, um, I, I, I at least it's helped me a little bit myself in the area of rest, um, is that it's, it's a, it can be rest of a particular thing, mm-hmm. a particular item that might that might lead me to be uh, to be l- less engaged in my relationship with God. So, mm-hmm. so it's not sort of sitting and kind of staring at the wall per se. Yeah. But it's putting aside something that is actually undermining my ability to be in relationship with Him, mm-hmm. or or distracting me from, or mm-hmm. taking me away from. Yeah. So, I, and I think there's freedom in that because mm-hmm. then. You know, God doesn't expect us to be doing everything at every moment. Right. Sort of so it allows for there to be an emphasis of, of uh, a commuting emphasis of, of whatever it is, kind of we feel that we need to bring to him. Yep. And we're able to put aside other things and be at peace about that. So, mm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not always easy, but... Um, you know, and then that that certainly helps with being present. Yep. Because that's such a big deal. Like this whole business of technology is a wonderful thing, but it's so easy to just get engaged in all kinds of communication with people that you're just not seeing regularly, or right. You know, this this kind of stuff is just constant. 
Yeah, one thing that I thought about as I was writing this sermon is that Sabbath really is a discipline. Like it, it's a discipline to say, I'm going to rest, especially in our culture. I'm going to choose not to respond to my email. And then it's so easy to try and flex our schedules. I mean, to flex Sabbath to fit our schedules, which sometimes I think is appropriate because not everyone has the luxury of this one day I'm going to take off, right? So sometimes it's like, I'm going to take a half a day here. I'll take a couple hours here. It's much harder to try and flex our schedules to fit Sabbath, which I think sometimes we also need to do. It's a discipline. Um, yeah, it's definitely challenging. Anyone else want to share anything that they talked about or are thinking about? Yeah. Yes, like even when you want to rest, you feel guilty about it or you feel like there's something you should be doing. I actually, I read another article. I didn't want to overwhelm you all with statistics, but one thing I read is that teenagers now end up like through work and school and homework and everything that they have to do, it's equivalent to like a 60 hour work week. Teenagers in our culture, they are so busy. So I hear you and I recognize that you're really busy and I'm sure that's very challenging to navigate. So kudos to you. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, Heather. Thinking about sort of like the process of also preparing for the Sabbath. Like yes. Setting it apart intentionally, mm -hmm. structuring your week. There's nobody can get away from the fact that we have tasks to accomplish, things to do, right. like actual things. But it's interesting, like even in the process of preparing for Sabbath, you're acknowledging like its need, its support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes intentionality to prepare. Maybe even like there are people who prepare a meal so that they don't have to cook that day. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Anyone else want to share anything? Yeah, Megan and Tammy. I'm just going to say I'm glad we as a culture have moved forward as a church in allowing people to define what Sabbath rest looks like for them. Yep. Versus, you know, like my mom's generation, your choices on Sunday afternoon were like reading books about God or knitting. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, like, and it was like forced, you know, these were the Sabbath activities. Did I miss any? No, those were the ones. Definitely okay. no cards. No yeah, cards. no cards. It was not restful. No. But I think even, you know, in that, it does um, sometimes give us more, you know, we think we're resting, we're doing yep. something restful, but we're really not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been. Call it, I rested by just like binge watching an entire season of whatever I'm watching. Yeah. But at the end of that, like you said, just kind of life giving. Is that actually done anything for me? Did that leave me the brain space to recharge and reorient and blah, blah, blah? Yeah. I think the intentionality, and it's kind of been mentioned in a few places, is so key to actually making this what we want it to be. Yeah. Totally. Thanks, Megan. And Tammy? Well, so for me, it was more the thought when you know, we're talking about resistance and reorientation. Because mm -hmm. when I think of the Sabbath, Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I never saw it in a way for like the resistance and the orientation. Even in the discussion for the discussion today, you're like, so what is rest? And Megan was saying, it's like, okay, well, rest isn't just binge watching stuff or just like indulging. Yeah. Rest is just kind of slowing down, like the, the slowing down so you're not bombarded by stuff. And right. Life giving stuff. That you said, but all these things where we never. Even Think of it, just rest like the Sabbath day, do nothing. It's like, is that really what the, you're supposed to be doing? Yeah. Yep. Um, our leisure scholar, Hunnicutt, he said, without time to reflect, to live fully present in the moment and face what is transcendent about our lives, 
We are doomed to live purposeless and banal busyness. Then we starve the capacity we have to love. We starve the capacity we have to love. A couple weeks ago, I talked about in our journey with Jesus, the direction we're going is to love God and love neighbor. That's really what this is about. And by practicing Sabbath, we expand our capacity to love other people and to love God. And I think the goal eventually with Sabbath is not that we just have this one day of rest, but Sabbath becomes a way of living and existing in the world. That Sabbath, this one day becomes a vision and it changes the way that we live our lives as we reorient ourselves towards God. He reorients us in the world. I have a friend who is kind of on a sabbatical. She's traveling around the world right now. She's in Guatemala. She told me about a story how the other day she was leaving the gym and she walked by this chapel and she thought, man, I'd really like to go inside. And she kept walking and then she thought, wait, I have time. I can go inside. So she went inside and there was this art piece of Jesus and there was all this water and she sat there and she prayed and she felt this yearning for more Jesus, for more healing, for the living water. And when she told me that, I just thought, what if God wants to use us in a really remarkable way in someone's life, but we just aren't, hold on, let me just, let me send this text message really quick. (laughs) What if he wants to use us in a really remarkable way in someone's life, but we aren't present? What if God wants to invite us into deeper healing and wholeness and intimacy with him, but we just don't have the time. There is a different way of existing in the world, one that is not fraught with anxiety and hurry, one where your attention isn't scattered and pulled in a million different directions, where you're not constantly thinking about the next thing that you have to do. The worship team is going to come back up here. And before we go into the last song and before we go into this time of communion, I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to take a moment just to be still, still, to practice a rhythm of rest, to just sit and trust that God is with you, that God is present, to reorient yourself towards God and the world that he is making. In this moment, maybe you thank God for something Maybe you let God speak to you, or maybe you just sit, and for a second, you allow yourself not to think about all of the things that you have to do. All the things you have to do for work, all the things that you have to do for your Super Bowl party, you just pause, and you allow yourself to be present. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you are a good God. You are unlike any other God. You encourage and allow us to rest. God, I pray for each of us that we would feel the freedom to do so, that you would guide us into practices that help us rest and resist the ways of our culture that separate us from you and your world, that you help us find ways to reorient ourselves towards you. And God, I I pray that in those moments we would feel full, we would feel ourselves come alive. In this moment, in this stillness, God, would you meet us? Would you restore us? In your name we pray. Amen.